Thank you very much. It's a, certainly a privilege to be invited to come here. Uh, it's it's an uh, honor to be in Taiwan where so much of uh, the important work on chronic hepatitis has been done. And um, it's also a privilege to, to have a chance to come to a meeting like this that's focused on this critical junction between the kind of work that most of us uh, as academics are used to doing and then the, the effect of it in the population and how, as uh, Dr. Chen just said, how, how do we bridge uh, that gap? How do we make what we're doing more effective? Part of the, the challenge from, for the academics, and I'm just speaking from my own perspective, uh, is, is to transform the way we think about um, uh, from an individual patient to a population. We're, we're very used to thinking about a person and, and the virus that infects that person. We're used to thinking about the drugs and uh, studying the degree to which these drugs uh, interfere with viral replication in vitro and then testing them and testing their safety and efficacy uh, in an individual patient and then seeing to what extent we can cure that patient. Uh, and, and of course, that's, uh, that's what it's all about. That's what we've been, been doing, improving that we can be uh, successful uh, in that. The, the challenge now is to think about extending our perspective uh, and, and to see how well are these achievements, how are these breakthroughs uh, affecting uh, the population that we're ultimately responsible for. So taking it from the principle of efficacy of, of, of treating one person and, and curing one person uh, or suppressing virus in one person to having impact uh, at the level of the population. So I'm going to consider uh, uh, five different lessons, uh, and there's not a terrible amount of logic to the progression that I have, but I, uh, from my perspective, uh, having been involved in the HIV field, uh, there are at least five principles that might be instructive as we start to consider how we're going to bridge this gap and try to take uh, effective treatments uh, to the population level. And first of all, treatment number, uh, Principle number one, lesson number one, if you will, is that treatment saves lives. Well, it's not a mystery to anyone that uh, with HIV infection, there was uh, astounding mortality associated uh, in uh, nearly every part of the world. In the United States alone, we had about 50,000 people dying uh, from HIV uh, uh, and in sub-Saharan Africa, it was counted in the millions. And then all of a sudden, uh, antiretroviral therapy improved. So there was this uh, transformation, if you will, in our ability to treat a patient uh, with the development of highly active antiretroviral therapy. And in association with that, marked reductions in mortality. So mortality on this axis and in the purple and the advent of antiretroviral therapy and its uptake into the population. So even at the population level, treatment saved lives, lesson number one. Now, with viral hepatitis, we have proof of principle that treatment saves lives as well. Uh, sh with hepatitis C, there are several uh, studies that I could have chosen. This is one from a VA study in the United States, veterans hospitals, where mortality on this axis is compared in individuals who uh, achieved uh, a, a, uh, a sustained virologic response compared to those uh, who didn't. Higher mortality associated with not being, uh, achieving a sustained virologic response. And then, of course, with hepatitis B, uh, uh, first uh, demonstrated uh, here, uh, you could see the effect of uh, lamivudine reducing hepatocellular carcinoma and then, of course, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma-related mortality. So we have proof in principle that um, our treatments for hepatitis B and C can save lives. The question is, um, uh, can we push those treatments into a, a broad enough a proportion of the population to actually have uh, uh, ef efficacy uh, as has occurred with uh, HIV. Lesson number two, treatment efficacy means, uh, so the improvements in efficacy mean 
improvements and increases in the urgency of delivering care. Okay, so in the beginning, when everyone was dying from HIV, it wasn't really so important if you detected infection. In fact, some people said, look, don't bother testing people because you're just going to ruin their lives when they find out they have HIV. Let them live in peace until they die. Uh, and, and that's really a more humane way of approaching the situation. But then, when treatments were effective and could save lives, then everything changed. And we had a burden to detect infection and to translate the, um, the effective treatments to the whole population. So improved efficacy meant that the urgency of treatment was expanded markedly. And so once, uh, we, once that was discovered in the United States, we changed our recommendations that everyone from 13 to 64 was supposed to have an HIV test. And throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, the, there was a paradigm shift so that you had to, instead of occasionally offering testing, it, testing was actually the expectation. You had to opt out of HIV testing. So the transformation in efficacy of treatment then led to a transformation in the uh, detection of infection uh, at the population level. And not surprisingly, you can see, look at these data just for one year, that uh, I can't even see them, maybe you can. Uh, 95 million uh, uh, HIV tests were done in that year alone. And, 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 and uh, notice all throughout the world, HIV testing was expanded. So this sort of commitment was driven by the, the developments, the efficacy that was proven at the bedside. I'll tell you as an aside, what's astonishing is you, you can find, if you look at the UN website, you can find these data broken down by risk group, by every country, by, by there's appendices that go on and on. And, and what's startling is you go click on the, on the hepatitis site and you won't find anything like this. There's every little imaginable piece of surveillance data for HIV and nothing uh, even comparable for hepatitis C. I'll come back to that, uh, or hepatitis B. I'll come back to that point in a bit. So we've been celebrating our advances in, uh, in treatment of chronic hepatitis, and I'm just going to consider, for example, here with hepatitis C. So this is the hepatitis C cure rates, the sustained virologic response rates, and over the past couple decades, we've had these incremental improvements, and now we might be up to 60, 70 percent cure, and we're looking forward to 80, 90 percent cure rates, and this is indeed uh, exciting, and it makes it a lot more fun to practice at the level of our clinics. But if we shift these successes and look and think about them at the population level, multiplying the percent of people who are cured by the percent of people that know they have hepatitis C infection around the world, and the impact of treatment on the 170 million people, not the, 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 the 200 in your clinic, but the 170 million all around the world, even when we're curing 80 or 90 percent, there'll really be no progress made. When we take this kind of a perspective, we haven't done anything yet. When we take this kind of a perspective, we're all, uh, we, we, we think we're done, uh, nearly done. So it really, uh, it really depends on how you look at it. If you were a drug company, you would, and you developed a compound that worked perfectly in vitro, and perhaps uh, theoretically in vivo, but it wasn't absorbed into the body, you wouldn't stop there. You wouldn't say, well, that's it, we're done. We've, we can cure the virus in HUH 7.5 cells, we're done. Because that's not the goal. The goal is to cure an individual. And likewise, there's no reason to stop uh, just because we can cure an individual when the population is not benefiting. So we certainly need uh, different models for hepatitis control. Uh, we need to start out with expanded testing uh, and treatment access. It doesn't matter how many cures you have if people don't even know they have the infections. We certainly need programs to make uh, care more affordable. And here it's important to recognize the partnerships that we have with pharma. And we were just talking uh, before this seminar on how important that is. And each country, the cost of treatment has to be uh, taken into consideration. And so we need to have dialogue and uh, collaborations to make uh, treatment access possible around the world. And then, of course, never to give up on cure. We, we've achieved that capability with hepatitis C. But with hepatitis B and HIV, we still need to figure out how to cure infection if we're going to eradicate infection. 
Okay, so lesson number three, you reap what, you're, what you sow. And if, if your first uh, you know, language is in English, then you might not catch this metaphor. It comes from farming, and if you don't plant your fields, then you won't harvest any crops. If you don't invest any money, you won't make any money. So what you put in is what you get out. And, and that's been true for, uh, for public health interventions as well. There's a dose-response relationship, if you will, uh, between the amount of, in, uh, of effort and funding uh, and the outcome, and, and I think HIV's taught us that. Prior to 2002, uh, there had been approximately 65 million persons infected with HIV around the world, and already 25 million deaths and 14 million orphans uh, because of the devastating effects of HIV. So notice that the treatments were effective, and they were they were working in Europe, they were working in the United States, they were working in Australia, but they weren't working where most of the infections were. And something had to change in order for that to change. So the Global Fund uh, devoted some money to treatment, and the United States uh, put in $15 billion over five years uh, to fight uh, HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis. And about half of it went into HIV testing and treatment. So $15 billion over five years, it's really not that much money when you consider this, what, what was going on. And if you, if you look in the years after uh, this program, these programs were started, and you consider the uptake of treatment, look at what happened in sub-Saharan Africa. You can hardly see it before then. And then you have this massive uptake, a 16-fold increase in antiretroviral therapy use in Africa because of these programs, directly attributed to these programs, uh, an, an accomplishment that uh, Dr. Chan, the, the uh, head of the WHO, uh, celebrated this summer. And in association with this, uh, if you compare countries where they had this program compared uh, to those where the program wasn't uh, in place, uh, reductions in mortality. So you see, we've taken an effective treatment and then we've put resources behind it, and then we've pushed it into an area where you need it, and it's reduced mortality, and it's had the expected impact. That's what we're talking about. So what about hepatitis C and hepatitis B? The, the only data I know well are for hep C in the United States. There were a lot of great discussions yesterday about uh, these kinds of things throughout the world. But if you look in the United States at the prevalence of chronic hepatitis, you have an HIV, HIV here, hepatitis B here, and hepatitis C here. And also, if you consider that hepatitis C just passed HIV as a cause of death each year in the United States. And then you come over here and look at the amount of money that's put behind these. It, I didn't actually make a mistake. It's not like just because I used a Mac to develop this, you can't see the graph. There, there is actually not, you, there's something there, but it's hardly even visible on this axis compared to what we put in to HIV. If you're in the front, you might be able to see it, but you can hardly even see what the United States is doing. And so it's not surprising that we haven't had the same impact because what you reap is what you sow, and we're not sowing uh, in chronic hepatitis. So why is that? You can, you can make graphs and complain about it, but it's important to study it, just the same way we would study a drug that doesn't get taken up into the body, and we'd figure out why is that, what's going on, and then we'd fix it. So why is one drug taken up, and why is the other one not? Why is one treatment, why is one program effective and another not? And here, um, certainly there's public health importance, but there's public health importance for um, chronic hepatitis as well. Interestingly, there's, there's celebrities that are willing to come out and, and say they have it, and there was a lot of advocacy behind, uh, hepatitis, behind HIV that really is missing, uh, at least in our country, for um, chronic hepatitis. Interestingly, I've been told by some pretty smart people that what really made our country commit $15 billion and then inc double that in the most recent um, uh, funding of PEPFAR is the economic impact on our country. It's just talking sense to uh, economists about, about the impact of what was going on in Africa and saying, look, it's actually good for us if we give these money. I mean, as physicians, we might be driven by different factors than our politicians, but it made economic sense. And making that argument is critical, not just coming in and, and, and sort of 
uh, complaining, uh, but making uh, a, an argument that matters to the audience that matters. Well, whoops, I skipped aside. Lesson four, there's more to disease than the virus. I'm not going to spend much time on this one, but I think it is actually a, an interesting uh, analogy. With HIV, uh, even after viral suppression was achieved, there's still diminished lifespan for an HIV-infected person because there's more to it than just the virus. Uh, this is mortality in, in Denmark, and this is in people taking anti effective antiretroviral therapy, and you can see that HIV-infected persons still have lower, have lower life expectancies than uh, the general population. In other words, their mortality is higher. And in the same way, we'll cure hepatitis C, but still have to worry about HCC and some of the end organ effects. And that's uh, true for Hep B as well in persons with, cir with cirrhosis. So there's more to the disease than the virus. And then lastly, I'm going to finish up with this lesson, which is that prevention, Dr. Beasley will love this one, prevention is better than treatment. So, and, and, and actually here, the lesson is hepatitis B, and the lesson is hepatitis B in Taiwan. And that lesson needs to be taken to HIV. It's the other way around in this instance. These are some of the most impressive data I've seen in my um, 20 years in, in academic medicine uh, in that uh, recognizing the potential value of the hepatitis B vaccine, you were able to essentially reduce the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma, even in children, uh, by a campaign that uh, was ex extraordinarily effective at the population level. I think this is remarkable, one of the most uh, spectacular achievements that I know of, right up there with the prevention, the saving of millions of lives uh, with the antiretroviral use in sub-Saharan Africa. You might consider another uh, infectious disease to drive this point home uh, as well, because if prevention is important, probably one of the best ways to prevent something is to eliminate it and eradicate it. And this is in your title, and so, uh, the title of the organization. And so uh, I'm going to, to finish with this, uh, with, with this example, because if you look um, over the last uh, uh, 30 years uh, and you consider how many cases have there been of smallpox around the world, well, of course, there have been none. How many, how many days of work have been lost? because of smallpox, and of course, there have been none. How many, number, how many sick contacts have there been uh, because of smallpox? None. How many deaths? None. And what was the total cost of this smallpox control program over the last 30 years? It's none. It didn't cost anything because we eliminated the infection from the earth. And, and so there's no more effective strategy for uh, control and no more cost-effective <laughs> strategy for control than elimination. Well, we've got a long way uh, to go to achieve these kinds of goals, uh, to control uh, chronic hepatitis at the population uh, level, that is. We certainly need to improve the safety and efficacy of the treatments that we have right now. For hepatitis C, that means getting rid of interferon and getting a one pill once a day that you can take for uh, 12 to 24 uh, uh, weeks and cure someone. For hepatitis B, it means going, I'm afraid, uh, in, in addition to extending the treatments that we have now to people that need them, it also means sticking with the basic science of eradicating the carrier state. We need to expand testing and treatment access uh, in order to find the people that need hepatitis B and C treatment, uh, and we also need uh, uh, education to, uh, to get buy-in from the critical partners, whether they be our politicians or our press or whoever. If, if you go to, uh, sometimes I, I talk to the Johns Hopkins medical students, sorry if I'm over time, but, and I, I say to them, how many people die every year of HIV in the United States? And they always guess tenfold more than the real number. And then I say, how many people do you think die of hepatitis B? And they always guess tenfold less. The, these are medical students at Hopkins. They don't get it. We need education to make these points clear. And then, uh, finally, to prevent uh, new infections, we have to couple these programs by preventing new infections and curing the existing ones. One or the other is not going to be uh, totally uh, effective. That's actually 
the lesson that hepatitis B is teaching to HIV because the world has no idea how they're going to continue paying for HIV treatment. So we can't just control and suppress infection. We also need to figure out how to eradicate it and couple that with uh, treatments that are uh, effective. So I've asked you to consider five lessons um, from uh, HIV that might have relevance as you consider this critical uh, phase of taking treatments that are effective and taking them out uh, to the population, beginning with the fact that treatment saves lives. Secondly, that uh, improved efficacy, such as what we've already realized, uh, intensifies the need and the urgency of expanded testing. Number three, you reap what you sow. What we put in is what we're going to get out of this. Uh, Number four, that there's more to disease uh, than, the, than the virus itself, and we'll always need to be mindful of that. And then finally, that we need to couple prevention and treatment together to achieve these goals. So thank you very much for the invitation to come and for listening to me.